Welcome to Healthy vs. Toxic, the podcast where licensed mental health professionals explore what makes a relationship healthy or unhealthy or even abusive, all from a scientifically informed perspective. Hello, listeners. I'm Dr. Patrick Beeman. I am the executive producer of this show, standing in today for Dr. Grande and interviewing the inimitable Dr. Romani Dervasala. Many of you may know her. For those of you who don't, she's a licensed clinical psychologist, best-selling author of two books on narcissism. Number one, Don't You Know Who I Am? How to Stay Sane in the Era of Narcissism, Entitlement, and Incivility. And number two, Should I Stay or Should I Go? Surviving a Relationship with a Narcissist. She's also a professor of psychology and a very sought-after commentator on all things narcissism and toxic relationships. I could honestly go on for quite a while recounting her experience, her interests, and various sort of um, biographical information, but it's probably just easier for you to go to her website, dr-romany.com, or her YouTube channel, just search Dr. Romany, that's R-A-M-A-N-I, and you will find a wealth of content there on all things narcissism and things related to narcissism. And I highly recommend her playlist, A Glossary of Narcissistic Relationships. So without any delay, we'll get right into this interview, which honestly was an absolute pleasure to do. Thanks to Dr. Romani and thanks to you listeners for subscribing to this podcast and sharing it with your friends and family. Uh, Dr. Romani, thank you so much for taking the time. It, it really is a pleasure. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Dr. Beeman. Absolutely. So our interest in, in asking you to come on the show was the, the popularity of your content and the unique perspective you take as a licensed professional. Um, I think you do an excellent job of balancing the concerns that people have and the frustration that's expressed on the internet tempered by your expertise and clinical experience and, um, I guess, more judicious use of uh, uh, information to, to kind of present these topics. So I would like to know just, you know, as a start, a little bit about you and how you got into this particular subject. Mm -hmm. You know, like I think everything in any academic or clinical discipline, you kind of stumble into it by accident. And I have to say that was a little bit about what happened, a little about how it happened for me in that I was sort of a traditional university professor. And then in doing some of that work, it's interesting, given some of the things I know you and I are going to talk about, is I was, I was running a um, community-based health research program. And one of the staffers kept coming back from one of the sites and saying, my gosh, these people are so mean. These patients are so mean. And I thought, this is so interesting. And the, the, the person kept coming back with the complaint. And then I talked down to the staff and what they were describing was an incredible um, pattern of antagonism. I thought, this is interesting. These people, these patients are burning their own bridge because now everybody dislikes them. The reception staff dislikes them. The nursing staff dislikes them. The physicians dread seeing them. I think there's no way these people are getting good health care. And this was a high-risk population. I thought, Goodness knows what other health they're, what a, whatever, what other risks they're putting their health at. And so this happened to be a unique population because they were either living with or at risk for HIV, which is where my research also was. And so I then developed about 10 years of research funded by the National Institutes of Health on these personality issues with a lot of focus on high conflict patterns like narcissism and sort of how these people get along with other people, the decisions they make. But at the same time, I'm also a clinical psychologist. So I was also practicing and people kept coming in with the same relationship story over and over. And some of them had transferred over from, they'd been with another therapist, they left that therapist. And I was like, that's so interesting. Why didn't the other therapist explain to them what a high conflict personality was? And so we would, I give them very simple psychoeducation. I'm like, that's so interesting. You see this pattern you showed me? They'd often come in with emails and texts. I say, you see this? This is that. And that is probably this. And this is that. And they're saying, oh my goodness. And I said, and this is probably what's going to happen. And this is what we know. And people started making rather quick decisions. They're like now it all makes sense. Like all the puzzle pieces fell. And I thought, this is ridiculous. Why isn't the mental health profession actually educating clients on this? And that culminated in the first of my two books on narcissism, the Should I Stay or Should I Go book. Then the election happened. 
And no matter what anyone's politics were, all of a sudden this word narcissism was getting tremendous traction in the media. And I noticed a lot of media pundits, a lot of commentators, and even some of the talking heads they were bringing on didn't understand it. And I thought, oh no, this is going to get dangerous. And that's actually where me and my team really stepped up and said, let's do something. And, you know, and I thought, oh, I'm not, I'm not exactly like, you know, camerogenic or anything, but I'm like, what the heck, let's give it a shot. I, I'd been media trained, let's do it. And so, and then that book came of it. I contacted my publisher and I said, I'm really, really angry. I just need to write. And he's like, write. And so that's where that book came from. It was really my belief that what's about to happen to the country, regard, I don't care what your politics are. This isn't about pol politics. This is about behavior. And I said, the whole country is about to have a number done on them. And the whole country had a number done on it. And I think what I've seen is that literally what happened in the country at large is what happens in individual relationships. I can't change the country at large, but I can work with individuals and say, here's the pattern, do with it what you will. You want to stick it out? You want to stay in this relationship? That's on you. I'm telling you what it's going to look like. You want to move to Chicago in February? You better bring a heavy coat. <laughs> it's the same guidance I give to people who are in these relationships. And so that's how all these pieces came together. And I have to, if I gave you one quick answer to this, it'd be, I got into this because I was angry. I was angry at what people were being put through. I was angry that no one was explaining it to them. I was angry at how much potential I was seeing lost in people. I was just angry. And so that's yeah. out of anger came this, this focus. So I, I would say one of the things that, that perhaps is confusing or really requires uh, some fine distinction, when you look at popular media, like on YouTube, for instance, or blogs, um, the, the word narcissism is thrown around just like the pundits you mentioned, but it, it seems often people are talking about either clinically related or I would say philosophically related uh, concepts like uh, pride, being a jerk, mm -hmm. borderline personality or histrionic personality disorder. And, and then more so, there's the distinction between narcissism as a trait and then narcissistic personality disorder. Mm -hmm. How should people look at the the terms here? Because some use toxic. I just think there's a lot of terms out there to describe a phenomenon of high conflict personality or difficult relationships. Mm -hmm. What what do you think is the best term uh, to to use, especially when they're all a little bit imprecise? Mm -hmm. They're all imprecise. I think that uh, the, the, where people are getting lost is that narcissism became a dirty word. It didn't need to become a dirty word, but it did. And the main reason it became a dirty word was a lot of people say, you shouldn't be using a clinical term. It's not a clinical term. It's a descriptive term. We really view it. Um, Heinz Kohut uh, in 1968 elevated the term narcissism to narcissistic personality disorder in 1980. The term made its first appearance in the DSM. Before that, there was no diagnosis. And if people like myself and certainly Dr. Alan Francis, I would say he who wrote the diagnostic criteria, I think they need to remove the diagnostic criteria. I think having this as a diagnosis has become very, very dangerous. It's a disorder that has no treatment. So why have it? Okay. There's no, it serves to me, there's no functionality to it. It is a, the majority of people with the disorder, the so-called disorder will never show up in treatment. And then what it does is it creates this sort of idea of like, well, they have a mental illness and then all this enabling happens. Right. How about we just take it out? They're taking out multiple other personality disorders. They've, there used to be 10. They've removed four. I'd say remove five. Get rid of this one. But until then, there's a whole litany. Every time I do a workshop on it, I have people generate the words that they think are, you know, could be used to describe narcissist, narcissism. And unfortunately, those are equally imprecise or inaccurate. Some people view it as, as um, synonymous with psychopathy and sociopathy, which it's not. Um, some will use words like tyrannical. Can be, but that's only a piece of the pie. I'm a fan of difficult because I think that captures the experience of the other person interacting with them. And it doesn't seem to carry the same kind of weightiness as toxic. Yeah. But toxic is a, you know, it definitely, I think toxic fits. It's definitely exposure to the relationship can actually make you sick. So why not? But I think difficult probably hits it better. I actually use an acronym that I share with clinicians. The acronym is CAVED, and CAVED stands for Conflictual, Antagonistic, Vulnerable, Entitled, and Dysregulated. Those are very technical terms, but that actually all together, that captures all the themes in narcissism without ever using the word. 
judges don't want to hear it. Lawyers don't want to hear it. HR departments don't want to hear it. A lot of healthcare professionals don't want to hear it. So I'm always trying to arm advocates, therapists, clinicians of all kinds with terminology they can use that won't get them into trouble. And I try to do the same thing with the public. But I mean, at the end of the day, not all narcissists are the same. Some are more you know, benign, some are really dangerous. And because of that continuum, it's hard to put it all under one banner. Yeah, absolutely. I know that's, it's a tough subject. I, uh, my background's actually in, in philosophy. Mm -hmm, I, mm -hmm. I studied philosophy and then went to med school mm -hmm. um, and have been missing uh, academia <laughs> for about the past decade. Uh, but in, you know, in reading just the history of at least Western culture, it seems to me that there are I guess, entities or ideas that descriptors um, that capture an element of what is called narcissism nowadays. The Greeks, you know, Greeks had hubris. Mm -hmm. Christians have uh, the seven deadly sins with pride being, you know, the, the chief of all of them. Mm -hmm. do, do you think there is overlap or um, can non-medical, non-clinical um, ideas inform our view of uh, personalities, personality disorders, how to handle relationships, things, things like that. Because, I mean, you say it's a disorder without a treatment. In that sense, then, you know, I mean, we call people different descriptors like I, I would say though but the thing is though an adjective baker is not to me not an adjective right it's a function yeah. but to me an adjective to, is is friendly is boring anxious so those are words like narcissism i would have to define what i mean by boring okay i'd have to define what i mean by anxious okay so that's the way i could describe someone but i have to tell you if i said to someone hey i talked to your friend your friend is boring they might be like oh i don't think that's true but okay they wouldn't say, don't use that word. It's so clinical. To me, narcissism is no more clinical than the word anxious, boring, stubborn, friendly. They're all, they're just adjectives that capture a whole list of patterns that are associated with that. Because I, it's almost like if I tell you every night, oh, for dinner, I had chicken and carrots and potato and celery, chicken broth. You'd be like, oh, you too. I don't want to tell you the ingredients every time. It's just a little bit easier for me if I have one word that can sort of capture this pattern. And somewhere along the line, somebody got to be in their bonnet and said, don't use a clinical term. It's not a clinical term. I actually think the philosophers have actually done some really, really interesting work because we start getting into, you know, where the philosophers get interesting is that they start bringing into conversations about morality and rightness of behavior, you know, sort of these value-laden terms that psychologists often steer away from. And, you know, in fact, um, I recently uh, put together a, lo a long article on, on gaslighting and, you know, where I found most of the most interesting literature on gaslighting was the philosophy literature, not the psychology literature. They had done the deepest dive, but the philosophers were almost like lawyers. They were very di distant from the pain it was causing other people. So they made a very intellectual argument with little um, with little ability, or maybe that's the nature of the discipline, for recognizing that this was, this was tearing other people apart. And that dispassion, I, I recognize, is the nature of their discipline, but analytically, they got it. Yeah. And so I think that what ends up happening, and I think this is the, this, the de this is the dead end I'm trying to break through in my career, is that I understand even why people become narcissistic, and it ain't a pretty journey to getting there. These people have been through their own thing, I am sorry they went through it, and it is not a license to abuse someone else. To me, the buck stops with you lashing out at someone. That's unacceptable. And I want to take the person being belittled, educate them, and say, this is on you. This is going to keep happening. So I'm happy to throw you back into these waters if that's your choice. But you need to understand you're never going to tame the shark. So you're going to keep getting bitten. Now, I've now told you this. You still want to jump in the water? And they're like, no, I don't want to jump in the water anymore. Some people do. Some people do. And then, I, then I, th that's, that's their journey. Let them take it. But the fact is, is that what the mental health profession, honestly, philosophy, no discipline has been willing to talk about the impact of these personalities on other people. Yes. And when people do write these books, they end up in the popular psych literature and in a, in a sort of an arm of the literature that's often not as well regarded, if you will. Yeah. You know, so it's considered that's the problem. It's, it's almost marginalized from the jump. I would argue that that may be uh, symptomatic of medicine, healthcare's um, own uh, narcissism as a, as a collective, because there's, there's a tendency for, mm -hmm. I'll speak uh, for all doctors here, 
um, doing my own little narcissistic thing. Um, there's a tendency for us to feel like we own diagnoses, um, but patients come often with these clusters of symptoms, concerns, and and things that bother them mm-hmm. uh, that that are distinct from an experiential standpoint. Like lots of patients describe what it what has been called now and given various terms, like you know chronic fatigue syndrome or uh, chronic Lyme disease. There, there are different terms given to uh, descriptors or sets of experiences that patients have that are kind of dismissed by physicians. Oh, that's not real. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a terrible way to look at it because mm-hmm. the, the mm-hmm. person's experience, mm-hmm. there's a phenomenological, if you will. Correct. Um, yeah, you know, like I, it's just, it, it drives me nuts, honestly. Exactly. Uh, it just absolutely drives me nuts when a patient comes in and they're like, "Correct." I just took this medicine, and a day after, you know, my my knee hurt, and then I stopped taking it, and my knee stopped hurting, or I felt really tired on this. And I've seen people are dismissed all the time in a in a clinical context, like, "I mm-hmm. know oh, that medicine doesn't do that." Well, okay. I mean, on the whole. Actually, let me give a great example. I'm an OBGYN, and um, in order to anesthetize a certain part of, um, you know, the woman's anatomy, if we're mm-hmm. um, doing some sort of procedure that will remove a piece of of the cervix, you have to do a um, an injection at, at that very sensitive portion of someone's body. And all the textbooks are like, nope, doesn't hurt. There are no like sharp pain receptors there, but I mean, it looks like it's uncomfortable and patients describe pain. So that seems more real than uh, than anything written in a book. Correct. So. Right. But it's a deny. I mean, I think that what we do, though, is we, what we then then a person will come in. They'll talk about their relationship. It could be a boss. It could be a parent. It could be a partner, whoever it is. And they talk about their experience in this narcissistic relationship. I'll just use the shorthand. And this person is often confused, full of self-doubt, very anxious, feels helpless, hopeless, powerless, um, socially withdrawn, isolated, you name it. If all I did was see that person in my office who's going through this relationship, I could throw the whole kitchen sink of diagnoses. They've got an adjustment disorder. They have an anxiety disorder. They're depressed. If we widen the lens and I'm like, they're in a really difficult relationship. I'm not labeling this anything. I'm going to teach them about that relationship. And invariably, you look at these folks, they, get, they either learn about the relationship or better yet, in the cases they can actually distance from it, you see an almost immediate return to health. It's like they're a person who stopped taking the medication and their knee got better. And I think it's the, it, this is a very Western bias. This is a field, though, that was written by white men. It, it has no relevance to the, honestly, now the majority of people who uptake psychology are not the people who devised it in the first place. So it, from, its, from its very, you know, again, I can get very philosophical on this. From its initiation, psychology is very much a field that was devised by people of tremendous power and privilege. We need to almost take that back, figure this out, because that's why it's gaslighted so many people. And so there is a time at which you say, you're sharing an experience with me. I'm going to believe your experience. I'm going to teach you what we know about these styles, these personality styles, how they may impact you. And then let's see where that gets you. Now, a person might say, no, I I love being abused. This is great. I love this. Like, this is what I believe I deserve. Then, I'm, then I got something else I'm d- different I'm working with and I know where I'm coming from. But I would say the significant majority of clients will say, now that I know this, that this person's not going to change, this changes the game for me. Like, I think I'm going to file for divorce. And I, I don't care if they file for divorce or not. I don't have a dog in that fight. My attitude is, is that if that's your choice or you're going to figure out whatever way or to distance yourself from your mother or whatever, and that causes positive change, then I've now seen sort of a bit of a, you know, I've seen the the arc of change that I need to see as a healthcare provider. And when they don't, well, then I have to give them another set of skills. But the, the field has been unwilling to do this. And honestly, I'm on almost like practicing like a rogue at this point. <laughs> I'm definitely practicing a defiance of traditional treatment standards. Yeah. And that must be a tough spot. Um, I, I think that you know, well, one thing we should maybe um, just touch on is this idea of um, narcissistic abuse or um, one of our, our friends, Dr. Todd Grande, um, refers to it as narcissistic exposure uh, syndrome, mm-hmm. um, just kind of being in the wake of somebody who has strong toxic tendencies. Mm-hmm. Um, what What is the sort of um, 
picture or um, syndrome that, that you see with people who are on the opposite end of a, a toxic relationship? I think that um, what, what you see is, like I said, a lot of the things I talked about, you see confusion, you see self-doubt, you see anxiety, um, you see some of the symptoms we might traditionally associate with depression. They don't get as much pleasure from life as they used to. They're very isolated. They often feel worthless. They feel helpless. They feel powerless and they feel hopeless. They can have a whole host of physical symptomatology that often have stress-related origins to it. So because, again, they're having almost like a, a, an illness that's manifesting as sort of a stress related illness, they uh, get a lot of second guessing. Um, those are some of the primary patterns we see. This. Obviously, there's an entire cascade of symptomatology, but those are the core symptoms we see. But more than anything else, it's confusion because basically they're living with someone who is probably consistently gaslighting them, who is consistently denying their reality, who is always putting their own needs first, who has no empathy. These are basic ingredients for human relationship. And in the absence of them, a person does not flourish. And so what you have then is because no one has explained to someone, this is not healthy. So if a person grew up with a parent like this, it's all they know. Yeah. And because we so value the wrong things in our society, many times people are cho told, choose a partner who's very, very attractive. Choose a partner who's very, very wealthy. Choose a partner who's very, very successful or powerful. Not to say that people who have those qualities consistently are narcissistic. But those qualities may cloud the person's ability to actually notice that they're being treated badly by either this attractive, successful, wealthy, powerful person, whatever they are, because we're so told that you want a provider, you want someone to rescue you. When we're talking in order for this to be addressed, the level of societal change we'd need to see is flabbergasting. And yet as a society, these patterns, these narcissistic patterns are enabled and emboldened all the time. I like that guy. He speaks his truth. He's just honest. And meanwhile, this person, they're, they're literally entitled and have no empathy and are just blowing holes in everyone around them. But he speaks the truth. And we get that all the time. And that's what I view. It's like the gaslighting isn't just person to person. That, then a person in a relationship with the speak the truth guy is getting gaslighted by the world at large. Yeah, totally. Uh, they, this person tells it like it is. Yes. Really, they're just mean. They're mean. They're mean and unfiltered and inappropriate and unable to be self-reflective in the face of other people. That to me is not okay. It's just not okay. And I have, you want to be like that. Great. I want to give people tools for how to avoid you. <laughs> and that's, I mean, that's uh, absolutely. Is there something in particular that, um, if you're seeing a, a patient, a, a client in, in a session that kind of tips you off or clues you into mm -hmm. perhaps they're, you know, dealing with a relational problem um, like this. Uh, so for me, it's a little bit tricky because I, because it's what I specialize in. Yeah, sure. People are seeking me out for that care. So they'll say, oh, my husband, this, and I'll say, okay. So instead of saying, well, I have to be sure I'll say, tell me, tell me the story of the relationship. So I never want to doubt them, you know, but I do want to gather the, the evidence base. And so I'll say, share with me the story. You'd be amazed at how many people literally come in. They're like, you know what? Would it help if I played a recording? And they will. They'll play a recording of one of this person's tantrums. They'll show me the sequence of text messages. They'll show me the email. It's unmistakable, yeah. you know, but it is, they, but more than anything else, they tell me the story. And it's almost as though the architecture of these relationships is identical every single time. I mean, to the point where it almost is kind of boring. It's like you keep watching the same movie, just that the characters and the settings are a little bit different. But it's like a Disney thing, right? It's like the princess gets the boy kind of thing. But it's always, sometimes she's got a fish tail, sometimes she's sleeping in the woods, but it's always the same story. And so it's the same thing with these narcissistic relationships. And so I, I hear it all and break it down with them and then slowly but surely, you know, find out how they're doing. And then we sort of lay it all out and figure out what was it that made them so vulnerable? Why did they stay in it for so long? You'd be amazed for many of them, there was that, that sort of sad hope this person would change. Obviously, they won't. In some cases, it was fear. What will happen if I end up alone? And what will happen to me financially? And so it's a very well-founded fear because in a divorce, a narcissistic partner will usually eviscerate the other spouse. So it's a pretty bad scene. And then there's also a lot of guilt because believe it or not, for how much we're presenting this as a difficult pattern, and that's why I like the word difficult probably most of all. 
is that these are actually, they're incredibly fragile human beings, probably the most fragile human beings out there. So they're kind of pathetic. Yeah. And so the day finally comes, you're like, I'm out of here. You sort of look at this really pathetic person who's just a tantruming three-year-old. No more than you'd walk out on a tantruming three-year-old would you want to walk out on this really sort of deflated person who still sits there with their Superman cape around their neck. You're like, oh, this is sad. And so a lot of people stay in out of guilt. And, um, and then the prime reason a lot of people stay is they just don't have enough information. Yeah. They just don't get it. So uh, just to, to give you an example of, of an experience I had while I was uh, a resident, um, I once saw a surgeon of sorts, I won't say this specialty, um, who was doing a robotic surgery. And there's this console, it's kind of like a pod they sit in, you know, very expensive instruments. Um, and it's got little arms and a joystick. Uh, it's like playing a video game. Um, you do surgery that way, but he couldn't get something to work. And I just remember he slammed his fist down on a, on the, um, console. And, and I was like, what? This dude's like 35, maybe 40, and he's having a, a literal tantrum right now. Um, okay. Uh, I, it's just like not acceptable. And I don't understand why in medicine, medical schools in particular, um, training institutions, it seems to be that a kind of emotionally abusive, narcissistic um, uh, culture reigns so and per gets perpetuated from you know, students who become residents, who become attendings, who are abusive to those below them. Um, and, and there's so many stories like this, but, but actually that's, that's kind of what I'd like to get into now to talk about kind of workplace narcissism in mm -hmm. general, or, um, you know, what a narcissistic relationship might look like amongst a, um, learner and a teacher, mm -hmm. um, any general kind of comments on those? So here's what's interesting. When we th immediately our knee-jerk reaction is to believe if there's a narcissistic relationship between a learner and a teacher, that the teacher is the narcissist. Sometimes it's the learner. Huh. So we've got to see it on both sides, okay? So let's start with the narcissistic teacher, which is going to be the more common model. Yeah. Now, already you have a person in a position of power, all right? So that's already, anytime there's a power differential relationship, and the narcissist is the, the powered one, you're in trouble. Yeah. Because narcissists don't know how to play nice with power. It's like giving a rifle to a two-year-old. Like, it's never going to end well. So it is they, they, their lack of empathy, entitlement, they're already fueled grandiosity, their need for validation. They, they're, they're almost this, this joy they get from watching other people squirm. It's like a vindictiveness and a, a deliberate cruelty of sorts because it allows them to fill their fragile ego. Ha ha ha, they don't know, but I know. And so their fragility gets filled up when they watch other people flounder. So it is going to be very abusive. It's going to be very invalidating. And because the learner is somebody who's still not in fully possessed. I always say, in fact, I just wrote this in this piece I wrote, that it's basically when you have a narcissistic relationship, it's the pathologically insecure preying on the conventionally insecure. And the conventionally insecure person is the student. Yeah. Okay. So who's sort of like, I don't know this yet. And all students are insecure. It's the nature of being a student. Yeah. And so because of that, the student is then going to be not going to learn as well may end up showing all those psychological symptoms I just talked about, the confusion, the self-doubt, the, the, the depression, the anxiety, all of those negative symptoms. They could end up losing weight. They may not engage in as much self-care. They'll have troubles with sleep, all the things we'd expect. So it takes a real toll on the trainee, again, who's not learning as well. And it can also kill their love for the entire profession. Mm -hmm. I have seen people with one attending, one preceptor, one difficult chief resident, that actually was enough for them to say, I'm out. I can't do this. I'm not made for this. So you've now lost somebody who actually could have been a very important and probably even a better one because they probably had empathy and kindness and they get pulled out of the game. So, I mean, I don't think people understand how far the ramifications of this can go. Now let's flip the paradigm. You actually have a lovely teacher, but a narcissistic student. The student is very entitled, has really poor limits and boundaries, demands things from the, the teacher that are completely unreasonable, expects the rules to be broken for them or shaped for them. Um, and then if they feel like they're not getting their way with the teacher, will threaten to go to the chair or the dean or whomever to complain about the teacher. So I think that it is, you would be amazed at how often you'll see that in a student. And so now this actually rather kind teacher 
is about to say they start losing their love for the game. They're like, this is, this is not worth it anymore. And we'll say, I'm done. I'm out of here. Like, I'm not going to do any more. T- I'm going to go to pure clinical practice now because I just don't need this headache. And so they can go either way. The personality style is a personality style. I think it's more dangerous in the hands of a person who already has power. But the fact of the matter is, I think, frankly, overall, it's dangerous in whoever's got, who's got this personality pattern because their, their constant perception of threat, their insecurity means that they're always punching and they never get tired of doing it. Yeah, absolutely. How about this? You're a medical student assigned to uh, a six-week rotation um, in surgery, and it's uh, with one attending who you're you get this sense like, oh, this person's a jerk. Um, but then they start, you know, doing certain things like, I don't know, having you go get coffee or um, ignoring you when you're trying to, um, ignoring you, say, in a clinical visit, not introducing you when um, they take you into a patient room or providing feedback or um I, I don't know, I'm not instructing you on how to properly get into an OR without, um, you know, doing something uh, uncouth, uh, as it were. Uh, if if a student starts to suspect something's wrong, mm-hmm. like they're experiencing some of the um, symptoms you describe with mm-hmm. uh, exposure to narcissism, what what would you suggest? Because usually in these cases, it's it's where a person can't really get out. You know, thankfully it's usually temporary, but correct. It's temporary. Like you said, it's a six week rotation. So it's a couple of things at that point. Um, I know that in that situation, and we see this in grad schools and I, I, I did my clinical training in a traditional hospital sort of setting. So I saw what that structure was, even though it's a little bit to the side of it as a psych intern, I saw how that all played out. And I'd say that some people would say, I can white knuckle the six weeks, but I don't want to derail years of training. Like, I don't want to hurt my position here. I don't want to slow anything down. I don't want, you know, because many times I hate to say it, the deans and the other parties involved will actually join forces with the attending. They're more likely to have that person's back than they are to actually stand in, in, instead with the student. Things are changing. Things are changing. I will say we're seeing some of the initial shifts because I think we've seen how the mighty have fallen. Movements like Me Too and all of that have put a lens on this. Now, is it, it, are, am I seeing just as many people filing these abuse cases as ever? Absolutely. But I also am seeing more and more people are getting their cases actually heard, but many, many, many are also not. So I think that in those cases, this is where the knowing about the pattern becomes everything because it is then that the person, the damaged person in this equation is the attending, the pathetic, power hungry, weak, needing to, to lord power over others because of their weakness, human being, weak person to see them as such so that you can then get some distance from it and say, okay, this isn't about me. This is this person and file it away. Let other generations of students know, don't take this guy personally. He's a jerk. Tell other people, don't work with this person. You will regret it. It is not, do not sign up for this residency at this hospital. Like you start creating the chains of information. Now, all the biggest mistake people think is I'm going to be the exception to the rule. I can win this guy over. No, you can't. No one can. That's the, that's the point. So if a person doesn't want to make noise and they just want to slide through, then you've got to understand how's the, how's the pathology and the person in whom the pathology should be housed, which is, which is the teacher, okay, the attending, whatever. That said, I never want to discourage people from moving forward. Some people within their residency programs, they have mentors, or they might even have mentors from back in med school. And I always tell people, have your one trusted person you can go to and say, let me, let me run this by you. Let me play this off of you. I want to hear from you your thoughts about this. And you'll get some feedback, you know, that some will say, go for it. Some will say, don't. I mean, it, again, I get it. Residents are stretched thin and exhausted. And the last thing they may want to do is spend months, if not years, in litigation and in hearings and depositions and all of that. I get that. But I want anyone listening to this to also feel that they absolutely have the right, they absolutely have the power, and they can go ahead. They have the right to do that. Like, I don't want them to feel like, oh, these systems are so against me, I might as well not. You should absolutely feel like you can. 
but to also not blame yourself when the, the system's pushing back. The system's always push back. You have the right to do it. But if you choose not to, then that's okay as well. But then at a minimum, see that the damaged person in this is the narcissist. You know, like at least push it off on there. And so you can say, I'm going to learn as much from this person. I am not going to get the coffee. I am going to get the coffee. You make your own deal with yourself on what you can endure, but don't personalize it. And that's the mistake people make is that they personalize it. Like, no, this, this person is, is a junk person in my mind. And so I, and I've had to work with many, many people like this. In some cases, it changed the shape of my career. In some places, you just sort of learn to endure it. In most cases, I try to get out. Yeah. How would you respond um, or suggest somebody responds if um, they're in a situation like very specifically where somebody above them says something abusive, inappropriate, um, something of that nature, uh, something harassing, if you will? The, 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 oh, your single most, single most, single most important thing is documentation whenever possible. Now, this is hard if it's a verbal communication, yeah. okay? Um, and especially if it's a verbal communication done in private where no one else could hear it in a private office, in a hallway where no one else can see you and whatnot. Obviously, to the degree you can avoid, once you, once you detect that someone is difficult or toxic, to avoid those kinds of meetings when you can. Try to get as much in writing as you possibly can. Vo always hold on to voicemail, save email, save text messages. If anyone else was in a meeting, say, you know, listen, I just want to make sure I heard this properly, grab minutes of meetings, anything you can to get documentation. An institution can do absolutely 0% for you on the basis of an allegation. They will do nothing. I promise you that. They'll say, listen, you might have just, you just might be mad at this person. We're not going to pursue this. But the minute you bring in documentation, things change a lot. It is about choosing your battles. Like I said, I wish we lived in a world where a person, when someone's saying this to them, that the person could feel that, you know, again, nothing documented, you and in person, mano a mano, they say something, you say something back. And then that person who's in a position of power, who's now going to punish you for standing up to them, may then start the sequence of punishing you. It happens all the time. Is it fair? No. Are they likely to win? Yeah. And this is where I'm not even going to try to sugarcoat it and say, if you want to try to tangle with one of these people, you can expect that you will get hurt. So it really comes down if the fight is worth it for you in this particular situation. I don't always feel like that's the most morally righteous position that people just sort of are looking out for their own backs, but our systems, the decks are stacked. And I hate to say it, they're stacked in favor of the antagonistic people. Absolutely. Yeah, it does seem that way. And it's really sad. I know there, there's a, an offsided study that about 60-ish percent of medical students or trainees, I think in general, it was med students and residents, uh, report some form of uh, harassment or uh, abusive behavior during the course of their training, you know, whether it's being humiliated in a, in a group, being asked questions or pimped mm -hmm. uh, is the term uh, uh, that's used in, in medical training um, when you're asked questions about uh, you know, a disease or a treatment, something of that nature. And and to me, that's tragic, but it also says something like, mm -hmm. why, or it brings up a question, why would somebody who wants to talk down to others, who is less interested in helping and, and gets off essentially on making others feel small, what, why would they go into to medicine just because you can do that? There's a power differential and, and, I, I mean, I guess, yeah, that's obvious why they go in because it's easy to have a power mm -hmm. uh, differential. And, and um, uh, the, the, the question, though, is like, how do these people like get in? How do they not get screened out during an interview process? Um, or the people doing the interviews are narcissistic, too. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, it, they didn't. Yeah, no, I mean, think about what's required. In order to get to med school, the person has to have done reasonably well in high school gone to college, done reasonably well in college, quite well in college, I'd even say, then have, you know, complete the MCAT, take that test, do well on that, apply to med school, compete with other students to get in, then compete. It's constantly competing. Any game that's highly competitive like that will always favor people with more antagonistic personalities. We do not yet live in a world where we're like, oh, you're empathic. I choose you. Who do you think is the one getting all the straight A's in the Ivy League school? It ain't the empathic kid. I can promise you that right now. And there is a, unfortunately, in our society, hustle and narcissism often get conflated. Mm. They're not always the case. I mean, those people with true heart, grit, and hustle, 
they're out there. But I think that what does also happen is that that arrogance still plays. I don't know what's going to happen when this old guard of attending physicians finally all fully ages out and we're left with a more diverse academy of medicine. And all. I don't know what's going to happen at that point, whether we'll see a settling in. But I do think that the people who creep into leadership in academic medicine, the people who creep into leadership in hospitals, people who creep into um, leadership even in academia, they tend to be personality different than the people who are like, you know what? I'm cool. Like I like what I'm doing down at this level. And it's not, and it's not because they couldn't be the leader. They're like, I just don't need the headaches. And they'd also don't, they're not motivated by the same kind of ego. That is not to say that all leaders are full of ego. There's some really, really great collaborative empathic leaders out there. It's not modal. It's just not. And so you've got to see who if they're making the decisions, they're going to choose people like them. Yeah. I mean, that does make sense. Um, it's just, it's just tragic to me because a lot of us are, um, you know, my generation, I'm mid thirties. Uh, the, it, I'm, I, I'm hoping that with, um, you know, a greater awareness of, of these cultural tendencies that are negative, um, really taking a hard look at the, um, institutions um, that, that we hold up uh, and the kind of systems that we let perpetuate, uh, you know, these sorts of negative uh, experiences in the, the workplace, mm -hmm. the OR, whatever it is. Um, but I'm hoping it looks like, number one, there are no more scalpels thrown in an OR because that happens all the time. Like somebody throws a, an instrument at the wall out of anger, like, oh, wow, you're an adult, um, <laughs> that, that, that I tell medical students, you want uh, a real pro tip, um, think about every other area of life. Like if you go do a delivery or a procedure or something, walk in, right? You make a huge mess, like you've got, uh, you know, glove packages open, you know, like all this stuff and you just peace out. No, don't do that. Like clean up after yourself. It takes like 30 seconds. It's expected everywhere else in life. Mm -hmm. You can't just go in, make a huge mess and leave. Be an example and, and show some respect. And that's part of it. Then too, I would say that uh, I, I still, I've gone to hospitals in the past two, three years where I walk into the nurse's station and, you know, there's a computer at the desk and someone will get up and be like, do you want this computer? I'm like, what? No, you were here first. <laughs> Like it's it's so weird how uh, in different institutions, not everywhere, of course, but like for instance, nurses what walk on eggshells around certain doctors. Oh, I don't very much so. You know, I don't want to call him at two in the morning because he'll get mad. But like, you need an answer on something, and that just creates this. I'm sure it creates negative outcomes. Although I don't know anything about the the literature on that. Mm -hmm. So okay. What about the other end of things uh, to kind of conclude this this uh, section? Mm -hmm. How do you spot a narcissistic doctor or therapist? I would say that it would be someone who, I mean, part of it is energetic, right? You sense this almost like a contempt in their presence, right? Um, they may not make consistent eye contact. They may not seem genuinely curious. Um, they may seem chronically distracted. This is sort of like the, the, you know, the EHR, the electronic health record is in some ways the downfall of medicine. Yes. <laughs> you know, I feel so blessed. My primary care practitioner, he is just brilliant. And mercifully, he's the same age as me. So I'm kind of hoping he stays alive as long as I stay alive because <laughs> he's so great. But I had to go through more than a few to get to him. And what I love about him is he doesn't spend the whole time typing into the EHR. He actually looks at me and then he's like, I'm going to just get that in here. And he almost literally says like, and now there's going to be a transition. And it's so respectful. I get it. He's got, he's got to see a trillion million patients, you know, at, at the same, on the same day. But his, his mindfulness around that made such a strong impression on me because more often than not, I'm, I've talked to many healthcare providers, physicians and nurses who spend more time staring at the AHR than ever making eye contact with me, which is unsettling, especially if you're going in with a concern. And so I think that it is, you can, it's a, how, how clipped is their tone? Do you feel rushed in the conversation? Um, are they, uh, do you ever feel doubted, you know, or minimized, trivialized or invalidated? Are you sure? Has it really been that bad? You know, it's not supposed to be this way. I think what it is, you know, so when someone says it's not supposed to be this way, that's gaslighting. I said, I just told you what is, 
but most people would never, ever, ever dream of standing up to a healthcare provider. As you gave some of the um, health patterns that have more non-specific kinds of symptomatology, like Lyme disease or many autoimmune conditions, many of those patients get uh, gaslighted by the medical providers all the time because it all doesn't line up neatly. And these are still syndromes we're learning a lot about. And so I think that, and, and with a therapist, it would be that you ever hear something like, well, come on, is it really that bad? Uh, No. You know what? Middle of the session, throw the money on their desk and get the heck out of the office. You know, it is not the job of a person who's supposed to be a healer or healthcare provider to doubt your experience. The first thing that a healthcare provider should be doing is holding space. Holding space so a person can feel safe, can be open at the most vulnerable time, whether it's, I don't even care if it's a physical exam. You're often sharing things that feel inappropriate to share or don't feel like things you've shared with anybody else. And so, listen, I've had both, personally, I've had both disrespectful healthcare providers and respectful healthcare providers. And the difference is night and day. And it's funny you say that, is that I remember I have recently seen a narcissistic healthcare provider and he sat behind his desk. I I don't know if you have video, but like sat behind his desk and legs splayed and like this, arms crossed. And he's like, so what do we got going on here? I'm like, what are we in a bar? You know, I mean... (laughs) <laughs> so it was very inappropriate, very, it felt very gendered. It felt, you know, and I felt very, very devalued. And it's interesting for a woman my age, who didn't even stop to think about like, maybe she's sexually active. And I should ask about that. He made assumptions about me. We see this happens all the time with healthcare providers, oh, yeah. women, patients of color, patients of different ability statuses, uh, p- patients who um, are of different linguistic backgrounds are often minimized, not asked as many questions. That's narcissistic. Yeah, absolutely. I I recently opened a, a, a level one opioid treatment program. So to talk about stigmatization and the general kind of um, cultural narcissism within medicine, the way patients with addiction are written off, uh, it's it's so frustrating to me. These the, you know human beings who are suffering. We're supposed to be there to help those mm-hmm. who are suffering. Mm-hmm. And uh, we write them off because, what, they, in our judgment, were better than them? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, I think that's... I think must be some people believe that. They have contempt. I think people sometimes have contempt for people. Well, narcissistic people or difficult people yeah. will have dismissive contempt for people. And, that, and t- here's the bottom line, and it goes back to what I said when we started this, was that it's interesting. Difficult people may not always get as good health care because people get tired of them. But I think that people who don't hold as much privilege in a society don't get as good health care because there's enough really difficult, entitled health care providers who don't give them the time of day and aren't taught to, again, hold space. And that's what this is about, is holding space so people can safely render themselves vulnerable and believe they will be safe. But you know what? I think people instinctively know when they're not safe. Yeah. And that sense of not feeling safe probably means you're dealing at least at a minimum with a difficult health care provider. Is narcissism uh, more of a temptation in mental health amongst you know psychologists or psychiatrists? Is it more, did you say a temptation? Yeah, to, I guess, do people with those traits or tendencies, um, are they more attracted to something like mental health, would you think? I actually think they'd be more attracted to medicine than mental health, to be frank with you. I think medicine still holds more prestige and power in society. Uh, So all things being equal to the degree they were adequately prepared. If, they, if you gave them either path, a difficult, entitled, narcissistic person would definitely choose medicine because they'd have more power. I think though mental health sadly attracts more than it's, more, far more than its share of narcissistic people than it should because there is power in that field. You know, there is the, you're, you know, if you do it wrong, you're telling people what to do. Absolutely. Right, which is an incredibly you know powerful position to be in, and so I think that again, I think medicine definitely sees much more of it disproportionately so than mental health would. But I definitely think we see it in mental health, and I can't tell you how many times I've worked with clients who said I was gaslighted by my therapist, I was invalidated by my therapist. In fact, some therapists would be so um, uh, what do you call it? superior that they'd say, well you know, my life is an example because I've been married for 35 years and I have great kids and my kids are so successful. I'm like, thanks, but this is my dime. I don't care about your life. And what does that leave a client feeling as though they're inadequate and don't measure up? And those therapists see the world through their narrow sort of Volvo driving lens versus that there's this whole panoply of experiences out there. And their job is to learn to be present with those experiences, even when they're discrepant from their own. And, you know, that 
that some people just don't have that in them. And I got to tell you, just like with medicine, we don't screen for mental illness in this profession. We don't. It's weird. And so, and I'm not saying necessarily, here's the thing, a depressed person can be a physician. Absolutely. A person with a history of substance abuse who's now sober can be a physician. A person with an anxiety disorder can be a physician or a therapist. I don't think those things stop a person at all. I'm going to be frank with you. I think a high conflict personality style is the one thing I say that probably wouldn't work in a physician or a therapist who's doing any good, but good luck with ever getting a legislature to agree on like, hey, let's screen out for narcissism. Never, ever, ever going to happen. And so that's the struggle. In fact, as a funny anecdote, years ago, going back where I licensed, I'm a lot older than you. <laughs> when I licensed, we had to do an oral exam. So we'd actually literally brought in, be brought in front of, into a room. I did too, by the way. You did? Oh, okay. So you were. Yeah, but it was five years ago and it was terrible. It was an awful experience. Oh, that's interesting. Even as recently as five years ago. Yeah, mine was well, well over 20 years ago. And you know, we had to do an oral exam and it was more of a jurisprudence exam, but also a think on your feet yeah. exam. The state of California got rid of the um, oral exam oh, probably about 10 plus years ago. And all jurisprudence is now delivered by a written exam. What I found interesting about it, though, was the, the but, and this is rumored, like this is back, these are backroom conversations, but what they were finding was that more than a few of the examiners in the room were using this test as a place to really screen out loopy people, including very entitled, antagonistic people. Hmm. The California legislature said this was never the purpose of the exam. Now, if you want to go back to the book and change your exam for that to be the purpose, well, that was never going to fly. That they would never be permitted under the laws we have that of protected classes and all of that. So they were never going to be able to do it. So by getting, they had numerous lawsuits about this oral exam, feeling that the, some people take it seven, eight, nine times and not pass. But and you can imagine those were also people who were more litigious. Sure. But it really did come down to that when they played the recording of the exam, you know, um, and wrote the transcript of the exam, people would have probably passed them. But the, the, their presence would not be, but they, they would be too bizarre, basically. So we don't have a way to screen for this. And listen, it happens in hiring all the time. You'll bring in an extraordinarily difficult employee because you get all of a 20-minute interview. I mean, people are in their very best behavior. They got the suit, they got the this, they got the bag, they got the whole thing. And how, how do you get to guess that? It, it's there more than you think, but the very qualities that someone like me might smell in someone who's narcissistic are exactly the qualities is that 95% of people would view as success, like a little bit too confident, a little bit too much swagger, a little bit of a too firm a handshake. And hello, Dr. DeVos, it's very nice to me. I'm like, whoa, like, <laughs> you know, slow down, soldier, like what's happening here? So I think though that I'm bizarre in my thing, like, mm, that's, that's, that's a little extra. So um, I think by and large, that's viewed as this tremendous confidence. There's no way to screen out for this, you know, unless you're really, really, really eagle-eyed. Well, okay. Let's end with this. Now's the season for uh, residency interviews. Um, so you got all these students trying to decide, mm -hmm. you know, what am I going to do the rest of my life? And uh, pff, lateral movement in medicine after you're locked into a specialty is very difficult. That needs to change too, but another conversation. It's very difficult, yeah. How might people get a sense of whether or not a program that they're going to or individuals they're talking to, you know, might be toxic. Um, are there some red flags you might get on a, a first meeting? I think you mentioned a few already, but mm -hmm. just to, mm -hmm. you know, systematically lay them out there. You know, I hate to say, and I hate to be this metaphysical and strange and saying it, part of it is energetic, you know, I, you know, it would be, um, are people looking at you? Do they seem interested in you when you're talking? Does it really seem like they're biding their time? So you could almost imagine them tapping their toe in their shoe, like, oh, do you want to be, I want to be done with this. Um, are they giving you, again, it's the holding space, right? Are they, are they learning about you or are they just yammering on about their program? Um, are they, uh, are, notice you'd have to actually watch how the room is being worked. Are they giving? Are they giving disproportionate amounts of time to certain kinds of people? So, like the more confident, brash people, are they getting so much more of the time than anybody else in that situation? Uh, how do they talk about their institution? If you come to X Y Z Hospital or X Y, you have come to the land of the chosen. You're like, okay, yeah, you know. So that might speak to an arrogance that's institutionally. Or very few, many of you want to come here. Very few will because this is where the special come. 
yeah, you might want to think, hmm, what does this say about the larger culture in this place versus a place that might talk more about how can we turn you into the best healthcare providers? We're very, we're, we're so pleased about how we serve this community. All of those things. Listen, some people go in for the prestige. They want to go to the, you know, the top shelf hospital where they can parlay that into the top shelf job or a much more remunerative practice or something. I understand that, but then there's potentially a price to pay. Yeah. That's why I'm saying about the eyes wide open piece of this. But those are the sorts of things that you will, you know, kind of often see. Well, you see that one person is holding court for everyone in the room. Like there's one person and then everyone else sort of all the other physicians or attendings are sort of like, you know, leaning behind that might speak to more of a hierarchical authoritarian organization of power in that organization. But if you really do need to be, again, at the white glove top shelf place, you've now entered into, again, shark infested waters, that's on you. If you've got a shark cage and you're willing to use it, good for you. You might be able to last and understand, I want to do this so I can parlay this into X, Y, or Z, but you need to go in eyes wide open. You're not going to be the exception to the rule. If people want to open their eyes even wider, where would you refer them um, if they want to learn about narcissism, toxic relationships? I'm going to narcissistically say, please come to my YouTube channel because I have more content. (laughs) I think those are like obligatory <laughs> jokes, right? In these situations, I. So I am going to be. So I, I view that as self advocacy, right? <laughs> but absolutely, and I narcissism. But I do have a lot of kind. But you know, there's over nine million videos. You do, and it's excellent. I, I would say you have uh, a number of excellent organized playlists too. Yeah. Um, to learn about uh, the whole gamut of narcissistic exposure, the mm-hmm. personality disorder itself, things that uh, can be confused or are related to uh, narcissism. It's mm-hmm. good stuff. Plus your books. Tell us about your books really quick. So my books are Should I Stay or Should I Go? Um, Surviving a Relationship with a Narcissist. That book is much more focused on the intimate relationship space. So this is your boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, fiance, kind of, or even your, your ex-partner. That, that's sort of the, the go, kind of go-to place for that. Don't You Know Who I Am? How to Stay Sane in an Era of Narcissism, Entitlement, and Instability. That book is much more, no matter what kind of relationship it is, it's sort of a primer and an introduction, not only to sort of incivility and entitlement in society at large, but sort of what are the many, many, many sort of defining qualities of narcissism? How does it play out in a wide range of relationships? What does this mean for society? And what can you do as an informed citizen under these kinds of conditions? And so those are the two main ones I've got. For those who want a more academic read, because I know that you are um, you, you, you cater to that, that audience, there's a really wonderful edited book called The Handbook of Narcissism and Narcissistic Personality Disorder. I don't remember the editor's names off the top of my head, but the, um, the, the chapters in that book are really ri- written by the best academics in the field. You know, people like Lonning Stam and Campbell and, you know, oh, Miller, like these are, these, are the, these are the players and draw from Kernbergian, Cohutian kinds of models and really orient you to the history. I think it's a really good book. I, it's a little out of date as academic books can get very quickly, but I, I think it's a great foundational manual if you really want to understand it. Um, and then, you know, and, and beyond that, I would say, then start looking around. And there's over 9 million videos on narcissism on YouTube right now. Really? Wow. Over 9 million. So you've got to be very, very discerning because there's some people who these videos are basically their ax to grind. They're mad at their ex and they've just sort of turned it into sort of like that. Yeah. And while I hear, I hear their pain, I'm not so sure that they're always guiding other people in sort of into the light, as it were. And so, um, you know, I would say that, again, please consider my books, consider academic books such as that one. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and sort of get to read, even there, there's the Oxford textbook of psychopathology is another great book that has all the personality disorders and really clear chapters on, on those there. Some people may really enjoy those. And then, then I'd say, just be discerning. Awesome. I read, I would read Alan Francis's Twilight of American Sanity. I think Alan Francis thinks more clearly on anything written by Francis. He was one of the people who wrote the original 1980 diagnostic criteria for NPD. I've really enjoyed his thinking and writing about this topic. And, um, and, you know, if you really want to go old school, you go back and you read Kohut, you read Kernberg, you read the original writings, because obviously that stuff is gold, but it can be quite technical. And there's a lot of case reports and stuff there, but I, I loved reading all of that. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. My pleasure. It was so good to talk with you. This is a great conversation. Thank you. Much appreciated. You have a good day. All right. Okay. Take good care. Thanks for listening. This has been a production of Ars Longa Media. The producers for this show are Christopher Brightigan and Madison Linden. 
The executive producer is Dr. Patrick Beeman. For more content, please visit our website at arslanga.media. To leave feedback or suggestions, send an email to info at arslanga.media. This podcast is intended for informational purposes only and should not be construed as medical or mental health advice. Ars Longa, Vita Brevis.